No question the cannabis industry is ahead of almost every other industry uh, because of its general youth and purebred entrepreneurship. You got your perspective. I just want to be happy. Don't you want to be happy? I love starting with the macro and then going into the micro. You know, I, uh, my college friends are gonna laugh their asses off that I'm on the cover of your magazine because literally their four year quest in college was to get me to smoke a blunt with them, right? So this is very, this is, un, this is unbelievably deja vu for me. I grew up not drinking beer or wine or alcohol, yet I became an unbelievable expert in, at 15, 17, 19, 21, 23 on the consumer of that product. Right? So, I'm, like, it's unbelievable to me in the macro that w- it's so obvious that the cannabis industry is heading in an incredibly interesting consumer place over the next half century. Um, and I'm not in a rush to make predictions or know everything just yet because this is a real marathon for me. I'm 42 years old and I think that some of my most intriguing thoughts or observations or accomplishments within the industry literally may happen in 30 or 40 years. So Gary, are both of your folks still alive? I'm sorry, yeah, they are. They're pretty young actually. They're 64 and 62, so they're young. What will they think about you being on the cover of a cannabis magazine? You know, my mom was super propagandized out by Nancy Reagan, so she was super hardcore, like say no to drugs, and so, yeah. I think, uh, look, I think my parents know, first of all, the great thing about my parents is, and I just spent a week with them because of vacation, uh, they're very thoughtful, meaning like I genuinely believe with my heart and soul that cannabis is a far better thing for so many human beings than a lot of the things that are legal in the United States, right? Um, on a federal level. Uh, and so, my parents are thoughtful that way. They, they can get, my mom can get caught up in the stigma of it. My, I think right now, if you actually like lie detector test me, here's what I would say. My mom would be like, hmm. And my dad would be like, he's a genius, that's gonna work out. <laughs> Which is really interesting, because that would be literally the opposite of almost everything else. My mom is my greatest cheerleader and thinks I'm a genius, but I definitely think, she, I'm telling you, Nancy Reagan got to her. Well, Nancy Reagan was a smart lady. She had a message at then and she did it well, that's for sure. No question. So at some point before 2012, you had the realization that corporate America was slow to pick up on content strategy trends. Do you think cannabis is making a similar mistake? Uh, no, actually I think cannabis, from my observation early on, is really good at it because you have such young entrepreneurs who are native to that communication. I think the platforms, Facebook, Google, and such, don't let them advertise in all the ways they wish they could. But actually, I think the cannabis industry is going to be the teacher of innovation to a lot of, I view the cannabis industry the way I view Procter & Gamble and Coca-Cola, consumer packaged goods. And I think that from, you know, obviously depending on what happens at a federal, state level, but I think they're going to innovate and show the, I mean, I'm very comfortable making this prediction. In 2040, cannabis companies are gonna be the ones influencing the way diapers and tires and soda and shampoo is being sold. So you often say that people aren't marketing in the year that they live in. Um, Any advice for cannabis companies wanting to market their brands in 2018 and beyond? Well, you know, again, they can't run the paid advertising on Facebook and YouTube that I want them to. So it's about influencer marketing and organic creative within the Facebooks, Instagram, Snapchats of the world, the end. And I'll I'll say this again, no question, the cannabis industry is ahead of almost every other industry uh, because of its general youth and purebred entrepreneurship. You said that um, one thing that scares the fuck out of you are nice watches and Ferraris. 
What is one piece of advice you would give to someone who is motivated by material possessions? Um, you know, to, to really create context around that statement, um, anybody who buys a nice watch or a Ferrari or a big house because they're disguising insecurity is my great fear, right? Using material things to put a Band-Aid on your emotional shortcomings is very scary. Um, and so my piece of advice is figure out that buying a $900 Supreme backpack isn't gonna trick the smartest people. And I was watching, um, I think it was Yourself by Southwest um, talk last year, maybe it had even been 2016. Um, and you often talk about, um, you know, the marathon versus the sprint and how building a brand, you know, is more advantageous than, you know, spreading your, your and like focusing on locations or trying to essentially grow too big for your britches. Um, I guess I'm just curious on, I, I would like to hear more, like the importance of like branding and, and what advice you would get and how people can do it well. You know, I think you and I share this and I, I would, I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that I'm aware of a lot of the people that are in the industry and that my voice is uniquely beneficial to this industry because you have an enormous amount of people in the industry right now that are so obnoxiously short term, right? That yes. you want your forefathers to be good, right? Because then you have a healthier industry. And so it's funny, I look at emerging markets, whether it's you know the emerging gambling market that we're gonna see because of the Supreme Court ruling, cryptocurrency, cannabis, what happens in these markets is oftentimes you get, you know, three to four percent pioneers and ninety-six percent hucksters, right? And uh, there's a there's an obnoxious amount of hucksters in the cannabis industry now. A because they just love smoking weed and they think it's they're gonna be fucking the Mark Zuckerberg of weed, or two because they see it as like a trend that they wanna they wanna like cash in fast. Um, you know, to me it's very simple. It's 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 as simple as this. Life is actually a marathon. Wouldn't it be a good idea to train for a marathon? You know, it's, it's that right. framework. Like, be patient. Don't like, don't like invest all your money on something that seems like this is the great, you know, this new formation of cannabis or hemp is gonna be like, uh, people are chasing a lottery ticket instead of thinking about what I want them to think about, which is you have a ton of 24 year olds in the industry, 30 year olds, and saying, okay, I'm gonna be in this for 20 years. 20 years, how am I gonna do that? Right. And so that's what I do, right? Like, I, VaynerMedia is now in year nine. I've only really run it for seven years. I've always thought about it long term, and now it's, you know, 900 people and now it's you know hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue and now it's a big thing but a lot of people that started companies in 2009 through 11 with me, my homies from Silicon Valley and others, even though they raised millions and millions and millions of dollars, their companies are out of business now. Short term thinking and, and this industry is, in the same way that the cannabis industry over indexes on really progressive um, marketing, it also over indexes on unbelievable impatience and way too many people doing it for the lifestyle, not for the business. You talk, uh, you know, you talk often about like the ways to communicate with the world, right? Like, so you got, you write, you got audio, and you got video. I don't think, um, for me personally, of course, this is just, you know, my perspective. That this industry has done a very good job of any of those things, um, and so where, what would you like to see? I mean, as an investor in this arena, now that you know you're working, you, you took up ownership in Green Street. What would you like to see this industry do as far as you know, writing and audio and video to educate sort of the masses and to get people to realize what what cannabis is all about, you know, because it's different things for different people. There's two things that aren't happening to your question. One, there's just not enough people creating. They're not doing. They're not fucking working. Right. And, and number two, 
they're being too ideological and romantic instead of speaking truths. I'm one of the most popular entrepreneurs in our current society, no question. Like, super proud of that accomplishment. I also find it intriguing that I'm probably the one that talks most about the shortcomings of entrepreneurship and how many fake entrepreneurs there are. I'm not getting high on my own supply. You're not? I'm not. You know, I think, I think I'm being critical and thoughtful about the game. And I think that one of the things I see in the cannabis industry is that no matter what conversation I have with somebody about it, they're on team cannabis without seeing any other part of it, right? It's like blind, it's blind buy-in. So what I would say is more work and more articles and audio and video output and, and more authentic conversations. Like what are you like actually thinking, not what's in the best, like do you know how many people are just saying things that are in the best financial interest of them in the short term? Too many. <clears throat> Most. Well, yeah, I mean, so it's interesting. We're about to, we're about to start a big project here where we're gonna really criticize the cannabis community. We're gonna do six investigative articles where we're gonna dive in deep and we're gonna say, you know what? When people legalized cannabis and they voted for it, they did so under the guise that they were promised a lot of things, right? And so are we living as a community and as an industry and as a, you know, sort of, new industry, like are we living up to the promises that we put forth? Um, and it will be, I think it will be very interesting to sort of put people's toes in hot water and ask them those hard questions. Uh, um, because it's very easy to sort of sit back, right, and say. I think, I think you you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna bring, I'm, you, I wish you could see the size of my smile right now. I'm so proud of you guys because it's very hard to be in a early to be in an industry that's this young and not just become the press release for the people in it. But what you're actually yeah. going to do is actually bring value to it. I mean, I'm telling you right now, <clears throat> my creative curiosity, my entrepreneurial curiosity and the fact that I know I can bring real tangible value to this industry is the only reason you and I are talking right now. I mean, I, yeah, I, I appreciate your time and uh, I think that, you know, like I said, I've done, I've, I've listened to a lot of your videos and your the podcasts that are out there and the interviews um, and I think they, you definitely got something to say, that's for sure. Um, I, I keep hearing you say that you don't like being, you know, sort of pegged as a pundit or a guru or a motivational speaker. Um, why is that and, and why not? That's a great question. Uh, I don't want that because it's not the truth, right? I spend 85% of my time being an executive of a 900 person four office company and I, I think it's important because I only think the truth wins and so that's number one. Number two, the reason I don't is because I respect execution too much. And I think that only being a speaker, only being an author, only being a pundit is pontificating and not doing. And I love to pontificate as my extracurricular activity to my actual doing. I also am even more excited that my pontifications come from the outputs of my doing. Very simply, I think it's a lot better to take advice from somebody who's done the thing they're fucking talking about. Well, fuck yeah. Right, like it's super hard for me to get fired up about a 20 year old life coach when they've lived 20 years. It's super fucking, I I have a lot of cynicism for somebody who writes a business book when they've been a professor at Yale their whole lives. You talk a lot about empathy and sort of compassion, right? And not, sort of giving a fuck what other people think of you, specifically you always say like your parents. Um, what would you, what would, what do you, what do you say to someone who is constantly very aware of like what other people think and sort of subscribes to that like ideology of sort of people pleasing? It's the, I mean, it's how do you a very, out of that mindset? Um, by 
to me, I think the only way you get anybody out of any mindset is to paint pictures for them to look at that are different than the pictures that they're looking at. And so for me, I'm on this constant mission to make people understand the quickest way to be unhappy in life is to let somebody else dictate your emotions. And, and the truth is, the people that dictate your emotions tend to be the people that are closest to you. Starting with your parents. Right. I mean, it's just fucking real. Like, I mean, are you kidding me? Like, everybody's issues, everybody's issues is with their parents. Like, all of them. Like, you know, like, obviously not every single person, but I'm talking like, I don't know, 90 something percent. I mean, it's a real thing, you know? Um, at one, at one point, um, when I did my research on you, you sort of critique the creative, right? Um, but they're necessary. And, you know, we need people that are creative and then we need sort of, you know, the, the, the tech people, so to speak. But what advice, I mean, we're in a creative industry. What we do at this magazine, there isn't one single person here, maybe other than a finance person who isn't creative. What advice did you give to creatives in 2018 when, you know, there's so many options and there's so many... Yeah, make more stuff, be less subjective, recognize that your ego and your power trip is the reason that you're trying to be perfect or spending too much time on stuff. We live in a world where we can get instant feedback, we can create a lot more content, there's a lot more distribution, wrap your head around it, you can't be a creative that lives in the subjectiveness of your own point of view. Otherwise, you'll become obsolete in the environment we now live in. We don't know much about like sort of your personal life, and if you don't want to share that, that's fine. But what the hell do you do for fun, Gary? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I you're not uh, working. I, I mean, I love the New York Jets more than breathing. So, you know, <laughs> sixteen Sundays during the fall and winter, I love that. I'm a weirdly passionate garage sailor. Like literally no joke, one of the things that is most fun to me in the world is to go garage sailing and buy shit for like a dollar and then flip it on eBay for nine. <laughs> so you're still working. Um, what else? I like documentaries. Uh, I like playing basketball and tennis. I like, I love spending time with my family. Like uncomfortably, love that. Um, uh, I love hip hop. Like, yep. if, your, if your wife could like tell us the thing that she thinks is like the most annoying about you, what would it be? Like you leave your dirty socks on the floor or something? Or? Yeah, it would be like typical fucking husband shit, right? Like I'm not paying attention, I'm not fucking like, I don't throw out the trash, like dumb shit, cliche shit I think. I mean, I mean, look, I travel a lot, you know, so that's real, you know, but I'm, uh, yeah, I mean like, and I'll tell you another thing, like, no joke, I, I didn't answer it this way because I feel like it was a little too cliche, but then I'm always drawn to the truth because I always think it wins. You can't imagine how fucking fun my professional life is to me. You have to understand, I'm a purebred entrepreneur for real, for real, for real. Like, documented. Lemonade stands, baseball cards, DNF student. Long before this entrepreneurship thing was cool, like, I was on it. It was me, it's who I was. And I lived the first 20 years of my life scrutinized by adults outside of my mom and dad who said I wasn't good and I wasn't gonna make it. Instead of entitlement, I, I was brought up in adversity which became my strength. I was told that I lost from the get by every adult outside of my parents. So imagine how easy it is for me to deal with adversity and negativity and trolling and setbacks and pressure it's the fucking dirt that I come from. So I read that, yeah, the lemonade stand baseball card thing, you know, I've heard that from you. Um, and you said that you focused more on making good lemonade stand signs than you did on actually making good lemonade. Yeah. Is that a testament to what you do at VaynerMedia? No, that was, that was a young Gary <laughs> that it took me a long time. But, but I will say this, I will say this. I'm gonna answer it a couple ways. No, through, you know, from over the last 37 years or 35 years since then, I realized the best product is a very good way to go. However, I've also learned that only the customer gets to decide what the best product is. 
How many how many cups of sugar do you like in your lemonade? Right, I, I mean exactly. Right, so so I think that it's both, and I think that learning that was really good. Does that make sense? Yeah. So listen, you're going to be on the cover art of our technology issue. Um, it's our inaugural. It's the first one we've ever done. Um, and in that vein, I mean, tech, like. What is something that you would like our audience to read on our first ever tech issue? You mean like what else should I, where, where else should you guys look to like fill out the issue? Sure, yeah. Um, you should definitely focus on podcasting and audio. It's re- very, very real. Um, the other thing is I do think a lot of the advancements in in the industry have been around the the units that are delivering the cannabis. So I think there's been a lot of innovation in that. I think that's a very good place for you guys to think about like 10 best delivery mechanisms or however you want to kind of like call it. Um, you know, I think- We actually are doing an article on that. I love that. I would, I'll, I'll tell you, there's a lot to do there. Um, design of the, of the hardware around the industry I think is, is very interesting. Uh, uh, even the, even the containers in which the cannabis is being delivered now, right? Like in drops and what forms. I think there's a lot of technology in that that people don't realize. And then- The um, delivery method. Yeah, just like the vapes and all that, you know, all that. Just the, like the delivery yeah. mechanisms, right? And so I think there's a lot to, hand, uh, to do there. And then I would say, I would definitely do something on like 25 best influencers on Instagram around the industry who aren't hucksters, right? You know, just being right. thoughtful and bring, and maybe it's a nine or seven. Hey guys, I actually, uh, I've got a little bit of an emergency I've been holding off for like 10 minutes. If you need more from me, I'm happy to do another call later in the week. Uh, I'll have my team set it up, but I've, I've really got to run, I apologize. No, nope, you already gave us more okay. time than awesome. we were promised, Gary. Thank you guys. Thank you so Take care, bye-bye. Bye-bye.